what Chris Rock said? What? He said, Gina Smith right now would rather be Bill Cosby. <laughs> Did you know those rumors? What's that? Did you know those rumors for years? Or? No. I mean, I knew rumors that he cheated all the time. I always knew he was a dirty cheater. Oh, really? But I never knew he was a uh, rapist. Jesus Christ. World's funniest rapist. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, rapist. What's up, dude? How's it coming along? Good. Good. What's going on with it? Anything? Um, now the same old shit. Where are you putting it next? Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe Broadway or Broadway. Somewhere. That was crazy. This would be on Broadway. What? Like, it'd be weird if this was on Broadway. <laughs> Especially now. Oh my God. I'll be getting a. Uh, what do you call it? Are you filming though? There'll be protests. I don't know. Are you filming? Oh. Film. B roll, basically. No sound? No sound? No. I, c I can unsound it. And it's like that B roll. When they have. That's how they make I knew uh, Bill Cosby was a douchebag. <laughs> That one I'm not worried about. <laughs> you know Mulroney? Mulroney? Everybody from Alan Jordan talking about Oh, I know that. I heard about that. Mulroney's in Australia, so. He, yeah. yeah. He comes back on the 23rd, he told me, like, on Facebook. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, he, he shipped off right where that fucking thing was going on. Of course it did. I know. Mulroney's I... always in the middle of everything. <laughs> Uh -huh. The forest dump. <laughs> the forest dump of bad things. Uh -huh. Greg, you wore the perfect shirt, orange and red, for the orange background that's here. Genius. Uh -huh. Colin, all I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm all I wanted to do was just snap pictures of, uh, just pictures of you. That's okay. it. Like a thousand. So that as you're talking to me, we just go through the pictures and there's no audio, no nothing. Okay. You're known as a comedian's comedian, and yet your work encompasses many forms of expression, whether it be television, theater, screenwriting, film roles, radio. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to be involved in media and entertainment? Um, well, I mean, it wasn't really that I wanted to be involved in media. I mean, I just wanted to be a comedian when I was a little kid. I, I, uh, I was watching comedians on TV, and I was like, I'm, the funny thing was David Brenner, of all people, you know, he was out there with like this cool open shirt and these gold chains, and he was like a cool guy with a shag haircut, and I was like, this guy's like a cool dude, and he's still a comedian. This looks like fun. Because before that, I, I always, even when I was a little kid, I watched like, there was a show called Can You Top This? In the 19, probably 70, 69, 70. And it was all these old comedians, this guy Jan Murray, who was a famous old comedian, and he had the gold chains. I think it was just like the gold chains, the smoking. The idea of night, the idea of working at night in front of these like sophisticated, kind of that whole nightclub scene. I just loved that idea. So you were watching this at a young age of what, like six, seven, eight years yeah, old? Yeah, six, seven, eight. And I just was into that night vibe, the smoking and the night vibe. I don't know why. And did you get into that like Johnny Carson and whatnot? And yeah, those kinds of shows the whole there? Johnny Carson thing. Yeah, the whole vibe of it. You know? who, who would you say are probably like your top four or five comedians from, from, from the, the earlier era? You mean that prior Colin? Yeah, prior Colin. Those but I knew you were going to say that. Those that's are, why. Not, yeah. Right, but let 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 let. Forget about those two. Well, we've got them. We've already got them in the bag. So let's okay. say we add another three to that list. Um, up from the old days, huh? I mean, um, I mean, there weren't a lot of stand-ups out there then. You know what I mean? Looking back now, I look at a guy like Pat Cooper, a guy like Jackie Mason. Right. And I go, wow, these guys managed to come up with them, managed to keep their brains so that they never really, they were never really unhip. Like Jackie Mason came back, God knows what year, I don't know how old he was, but he came on Broadway and he was funny, still funny and still like aware of everything that was going on. So that's a style like I didn't appreciate when I, when I was young, but nobody did. They dismissed guys like that, like, oh, they're Catskills guys, yet they're still funny this whole time. So that's a whole different thing. But like Lily Tomlin, like she was great. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, she wasn't really a stand-up, per se. I mean, um... She was a comedic actress. Comedic actress, but she did the one-woman show. Like, Eric Bogosi and that kind of thing is really funny. But it's also, it's a different thing, you know? You, you, you got Jackie Mason on Tough Crowd. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, and Pat Cooper was on all the time. Right, and I one of to... one of my favorite. I mean, one of my favorite moments with you, Patrice, and Jackie Mason is when Patrice hands you the cell phone and asks you to ask Jackie Mason what, like, give this to Jackie and ask him what it is. <laughs> Patrice said that. Yeah, I I don't you know I, I don't even know if you if you look back on Tough Crowd and I have watched. I don't. It, uh, tough, the, the, the cancellation of Tough Crowd was very rough on you. We saw it on the show that night, and we, we still continue to hear it. Like, if we're listening to Opie and Anthony or any other show, right. we, still, we still get you talking about it. Is, are there some executives in, in some building somewhere who would literally have to turn the corner if you're walking down that hall? No. I know all the people involved, and it's like, you know, it's like anything else. It's not one person. It's more like, I feel like what canceled Tough Crowd was not executives. I feel like it was a mindset of, of show business in general, you know, of, of, of the comedy business, of show business, which is like, that show is mean spirit. That show is coming from a place that we don't really, you know, these are people that love the open, everybody always claims they want an honest, open discussion. Right. They want something that's spontaneous. They want something different. But then when you give it to them in a form, they don't really, where well, there's actually opinions that make them unhappy or they don't like the opinion, they don't really want that. So it just goes to show there's a, that that closed mind, like the, you know, the censorship and the closed-mindedness goes on every side of... Uh, well, you've mentioned also that in this day and age, Tough Crowd would be even harder to get on on the air. Like in this, in yes, this time, as time, compared to more, even back then. Even back then, I thought 2002 to 2004 was politically correct, now it's ten times worse. Okay. Ten times worse. Um, I was happy to look on uh, Wikipedia and see that there's been a change to your, your profile. Your parents were teachers. Yes. And you went to a high school that was built on the principles of John Dewey. Yeah, well, yeah, more or less. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of high schools get named after people. I mean, go to George Washington High School, they're all built on the principles of George Washington. But The reason I say this is yes. because I had a friend who was going, uh, who, who became a teacher. Him and his wife are teachers. Right. And this guy was his role model, so I'd have to like read through his papers and tell him what oh, I thought okay. about John Dewey because yes. what he wanted to do was make sure like the students were interactive in what they were doing. That you know, right? Now I didn't, and then I was so happy that I was, I was able to ask you this question or come up and ask you this question, and then I listened to an interview that you did for NPR where you said you were a rambunctious kid and a class clown and a troublemaker. So the whole John Dewey system was lost on you. No, the whole John Dewey system is great. If you're if you're not like I am, it's great. It's a great system. But when you're like a, a person that just takes advantage of situations like that and just cuts out of school, and you know, when you have a trust method, it works with well-intentioned people. But with creeps like myself, we just take advantage of it and cut out of school, try to pass, try to get. You know what I mean? But I was, believe me, I was in schools before that, and I was still always a class clown. I just was. I right. Had, you know. So the entertainment aspect of so it didn't matter if it was John Dewey or you know. Right. Right. Saint Francis. It wouldn't have mattered what it was. I was going to be you know cutting out of school because I just hated school. Okay. So um, Tough Crowd had many guests, but for the most part, it consisted of Nick DiPaolo, Patrice O'Neill, Greg Giraldo, Jim Norton, Keith Robinson, Robert Kelly, and Rich Voss. Could I get and you? Judy Gold and Jim David. Ju Judy Gold, Jim David. That's right. Sure. And. Um, could you could you give me a little bit of a report card on these, on these comedians, um, on where they are today? No, no, I mean, no, no, all no. In the CD area today. No, no, <laughs> no. I mean, I mean on on their personality, on their 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 heart. Each like one. That. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you had uh, uh, Jim Norton was uh, you know very. They all had the one thing they all had in common was they were pretty honest. You right. Know what I mean, which most comedians are, but they were you know. I mean, Jim Norton's brutally honest, as it always has been, you know, and... Uh, well, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of brutally honest comedians, but somehow the guys that ended up gravitating uh, around the cellar at that table ended up being probably, I would consider, like, some of the more brutally honest. I mean, Patrice, yeah. DePaulo, Norton... Yeah, and the thing about a guy like uh, Jim David, even though it wasn't that much of the... He was so funny at that table, he would just, like, stand up for himself so much that that's why we used to have him all the time, because he was just, like, you know... He was just outraged by it, and uh, and Judy the same thing. Judy was just like, didn't care, you know. What I mean, she would just fight just for the drop of a hat. Oh, I spoke to her uh, in Montreal. I said, let's talk about LGBT uh, LGBT issues. She's like, oh, who cares about that? 
She's just just hilarious. Yeah, she's funny. And um, has has Jim David ever been able to get you a Lucy Lortel theater? No. Did he say he was going to do that? You asked him on on Tough Crowd. You had said, "Well, maybe Jim, if you could get me one of those Lucy Lortel theaters, yeah. things would go things would go good." Yeah, I should have been at the Lucy Lortel. Yeah, Jim um, talks a big game, but you know he's not really in the gay community. Jim does stand up on the road all the time, so he's not really, you know, part of the. He's part of the, uh, you know. There's no gay community on the road. There's just a random guy that you make eye contact with, and you're like, okay, let's do this, you know. Yeah. Watch your hands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hi, buddy. Hop in, up, brother. I didn't mean brother like that. Uh, I didn't mean brother like that. I was just I get it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> You're also a frequent contributor on the Opie and Anthony show. Um, there are entire like compilations of when you visit the show. Are you aware of this? Have you ever seen any of these? No, I don't listen to them, but I, I, I know that they're there. Yeah, sure. Right. Well, one of my questions to you was, have you ever thought of doing... Um, maybe a like a monthly, weekly. I would consider monthly because you just seem very busy. Would you ever consider a monthly show of maybe two hours? Of what, like a tough crowd? Of a, of 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 like a radio show. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I feel like everybody's doing everything. You know, it's like everybody's doing these shows now. So it's kind of, you know, I mean, if I was. If I was going to do a tough crowd type show on radio, then I would do it, you know. But like I said, well, even, that's what even I mean. That, well, I, I, along those lines too, because I even mean, radio now is politically correct. I mean, you see, they fired Anthony, right? And so people are like, well, he was over the line. It's still co comparatively what he said was mild compared. You know what I mean? It's oh, right. It's so politically correct that it, you know what I mean. It's not even. It's hard to delve into. It's hard to take it seriously, as right? Thing, you know? And and what happened with Sirius is that now, with what was supposed to happen with Sirius XM, was that you could pretty much say anything you wanted, and now it's it's been bumped down to the internet, where you're allowed to say right. anything That's you right. want. So if you got the right sponsors and you got paid for it, yeah, would you consider it like a tough crowd, either a tough crowd type show or or a radio show? Yeah, of course. I mean, if the people let me do what I want, but. You know, I mean, I don't know if I have a reputation or whatever, but I mean, it's like, they won't, you know what I mean? Like, people are just very like, whoa, you know, I mean, I mean, I just never thought in those terms. And now it's like, if I do it, I feel like, oh, I'm just doing what everybody else is doing, a podcast or whatever, you know. Well, I mean, to a certain, de to a certain degree, but uh, like Patrice used to like to say, he used to like to say that he had a boutique audience. Right. And I think that with your Twitter followers and the people that follow you, sometimes we'd like it if... You were talking to maybe Jerry or someone else as a part to Bobo or Lady Di. No disrespect to those wonderful of humans. Not. No disrespect to them. No. But I mean, um, uh, the last time I spoke to you, I mentioned the DVD extras to Long Story Short. Right. And um, you said you've seen only half of that show because, I mean, for, for comedians, it's tough to go back and look and see what you've done. Yeah. You're always trying to move ahead. Trying to move ahead. But if you do listen to the audio commentary... And let that play on its own in the background. You would notice that, okay, you guys are commenting on uh, Long Story Short. But, I mean, we're finding out things about Jerry Seinfeld, that he's an Italophile. You know what I mean? Yes. That his love of Italy and all those things. Right. The funny thing about all comedians and how high-tech they are, they always have written notes before they go on or when they go on. Yeah. Having seen your show on December 3rd at uh, the brokerage, I'm driving around, so I'll see a town, and I'll see Suffolk, and I'll see other towns like that, right? Um, you, like, it, I'm not going to talk too much about the set that you did, um, but what you've been doing on ONA when you go on the show, and what you did when you did your, when you did an hour on December 3rd, right. was you really brought up that, that neighborhood aspect. I know right. you brought up Park Slope, where, where right. you were born, right. and the stoop and that you used for Irish Wake. Right. Okay? But now it's like you're also coming back around full circle. You're talking about Long Island. See, I thought when you were on the show that you'd just bring up um, Northern Islet or the... You know, Central those, Islip and, yeah, Ronkonkoma. Uh, Ronkonkoma, Patchong, all those places. I yeah. thought you were doing it because they got a kick out of it, hearing it from you. So I thought you were doing it for a kick. 
But when you when you did the, when you did that hour last uh, two weeks ago, I just I noticed that that a, a good portion of your set was talking about like uh, going out in the boonies, like when you go visit your cousins and right. things of that nature. Well, but it's also because this New York, all the old New York, by which I mean all the people that lived in Brooklyn, all the white ethnics, for lack of a better word, and even Puerto Rican and black to a certain extent. All the people that grew up in those neighborhoods where I, when I was growing up now live in Long Island and, and uh, Westchester and, and Orange County, New York. Right. So they don't live in the city anymore. So it is so it is kind of like when I'm saying, hey, remember Brooklyn, those people don't live in Brooklyn. They live here now. All right. There was a move that they made. There was a move that they've been making for 50 years. That, that, so, it's a slow progression where you go out to somewhere where you can you can get cheaper land to build a bigger house. Is that exactly? It? Okay, and live that American dream. But then when people get out, they're like, "Oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? I find myself in the, the middle back, yeah. of nowhere, right. and I got rid of a great place that now has skyrocketed in growth." That's the other thing. Yeah, now that Brooklyn is this hot place, you know. Um. Hmm. Do you consider Al Cantor? From the neighborhood to have been a storyteller performer, Al Cantor. I I went to Stony Brook with Al Cantor. Oh, he, How the he hell do you know him? I th well, I listened to a lot of the stuff that uh, I listened to because he was supposed to be here tonight. He was here about a month ago. Oh, okay. So I thought he, I thought his, <laughs> I thought he called in. Well, Al Cantor was a was a great, great, great funny storyteller. Yes, I mean brilliant. He he, he was in. I, you made it sound like he was older than you. No, he's my age. He was your age, and he was a guy that led, led, led around that time with the stoop in in Brooklyn. In no, no, not in Brooklyn. This is when it was Stony Brook. When okay. I went to Stony Brook College University, Al was on my hall. Okay. So he's from Long Island. He's from Massapequa. You're supposed to be here tonight, but I don't think you're coming. And he didn't. He didn't make it in. No, but he is one of those guys that's, you know, some people are just funny, and he was just one. There's different kinds of funny people, but there's a lot of people that are funnier, as funny as comedians, but it's a whole different art. You know what I mean? Like, right. It's like, a, it's like there's great fighters and then there's great boxers. So we're the boxers. We're trained professionals. Right. But there's a lot of people that if they trained, they'd be great fighters. They'd be better fighters than most the, the boxers. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Al was one of those guys. He was just, he'd come back, he worked in the ambulance. So he's always in the ambulance court. And so... He'd come in and start telling these stories. And as you got to know him, like any comedian, you got to know his shorthand. So he'd be like, I'm at the ambulance corps. Al is uh, doing his... And he was just going to these descriptions of the different people giving him shit when he's, like, trying to help them and the drunk. And he goes, and guess who I saw? Your buddy. Your little buddy. So-and-so. And he told Al to go fuck himself. He'd be smiling like right, right. the night. So he could just go over... But again, it's a good lesson, which is that ideally in comedy, you would have an ex a, a nightly experience. Like he was a guy that would just tell a story of his night. Right. But because we kind of knew him and because he was such a good storyteller, it would only be about 10, 12 minutes. Right. But every night he's coming back with a new experience, you know? So if you knew a little bit of the backstory, it would be brilliant. You know? Right. And what you, one, of the, one of the things you, um, you say to young comedians is also to get a... Get some job or work experience before... Uh, we all tried to get out of our jobs. Every comedian to this day goes, if I had more time to write. Right. And we don't realize we're so stupid. We don't realize the only thing I write about is, what was that funny guy I used to work with? It's right there for you right now. But instead, we're like, I want to get past. Then I can really write. And then I'm going to write eight hours a day. You know? You... you 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 also have written um, you've written screenplays. Oh, I've written so much stuff here. Yeah. Right, and um, and you took a class in it. Yeah. How many how many classes did you take? About, about just one class, but I read all the screenplay books, like ten books. Did you 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 obviously read Sid Field, Act One, Act Two, Act Three? Did you read William Frog's book? I think so. What's it called? Uh, uh, Screenwriting Tricks of the Trade. Yes. Where he was he was a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? Well, because he didn't. I read almost so long ago. He didn't go for the act one, act two, act three. Right. What, what he, the way he saw it was just basically you're telling your story and he focused a lot on scene cards and things like that. Did you get to the point where you were using scene cards in order to like be able to get like a, a mental image of how your film would go? Yeah, of course. But I mean, my problem has always been that I have to try to do it my own way. So 
first I would write all these scenes and these characters. First thing I would do was the characters. Because if you're not interested in your characters, right. who's going to be interested? Like I always used to say with Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey goes to sit at a diner and goes to you know order his meal from the waitress and he's got the silverware. It's, if you read that scene, you'd say, this is not an exciting scene. But you know Jim Carrey's going to do some, so many different things that are funny because he's Jim Carrey. Right. He's going to bring the knife and... I read that screenplay, Ace Ventura, the one that blew him up the first one. Right. It was all right. It wasn't terrible, but I read it and I was like... It was around for like three years. They offered it to all these people. And I was reading it and I was like, this is not that great. But Jim Carrey brought all these little things that made it, you know? So it's the character first. Then it's the, then it's the action and scenes. But I never was like, oh, you don't have to worry about that other shit, page uh, reversal and all that. And you really don't, as far as I'm concerned. I agree with him. Like it got to be too much with people. Like, oh, now on page thirty, he has to find out she's really uh, engaged or whatever. That you know, right, right. it gets For to be too like, formulaic. R r yeah, ridiculously formulaic. Yeah. And it kind of changed. I mean, Pulp Fiction kind of changed that for everybody. Where Pulp Fiction was, yeah. You know, and The Hangover, I think, had a bit of success also because they, you had no idea. You you couldn't say one step ahead of the time right, what was right, going to happen. Right. Um, but you you've got so many friends in show business. Um, do you do you write with your either your your comedians like as a lot of your comedian friends are actors? Do you write with them in mind? Do you or, or do you or if you're working on a certain script, are you thinking, wow, you know, like Joe Pesci would be great in this, or this or that guy would no, be great? No, that in was this? my mistake. I really wrote. I tried to write these because most of the things I've written are about immigrants. Right. So most of my friends in comedy are not immigrants. Most of the stuff I write is first generation immigrants. So I hang out with these Arabs and I hang out with these Asians. So I'm trying to write about like this kind of stuff, like immigration. Right. That's my thing, you know. And um, and Queens, which I'm not even from Queens, but just spent a lot so of time. So ethnicity, Queens. ethnicity is my thing. Queens, Queens, ethnicity, all that stuff here. Right. And so, are there actors out there that fit that description that you know that you want to? I'm sure they're all. But I mean, I just never got to this. I never got past the opening stages. Okay, but you have written these scripts, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing that you've you've mentioned writing is the manifesto. Now, guys like Jay Moore like to like to bug you about it. Who Jay Moore? Who, by the way, does maybe one of the best impressions. One of the best. He does. He set the tone. He changed the whole. Before that, every impression he was like, "Yeah, well, man, yeah, but Jay Moore does my breathing, and everybody thinks they're doing me, but they're doing Jay Moore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, he he broke the mold on that one. These guys, these guys, they 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 really respect you, and um, even coming into Governors tonight. The girl said, "You know, Colin, he's good people." So, so do you find like, um, you know, you've mentioned this also. You know, like the success of, let's say, uh, an Eddie Murphy, a Louis, or or whatnot. Right. Are you comfortable with the amount of success that you've had? No. You want you you want more success. I and never wanted to be more famous than I am rich, and I'm much more well known than I am rich, and I don't like it. But I mean, you know, I could have done things differently, I guess. But I did the way I did it. But I'm not, I'm not one of those people that goes, "Hey, you know what? No regrets." It's like, no, I have some regrets. Strategic moves. Right. Right. Strategic. Being certain places you should have been and keeping your mouth shut when you were there. Different things like that. Right. Right. You say that you should have played the game a little bit more when you were when you should have you should have just several times gone right. on out, had the wine and cheese, what and what. Yes, I mean, just several times I just didn't play the game, you know. But it's my nature, I guess, or whatever. I don't know. But like I even say in this show, when I'm talking about ethnicity, how I feel like Irish people get just as much pleasure out of telling telling the story the rest of their life how I told the guy to go fuck himself and keep his money as they would be by getting money. Right. Right. Like it's sort of like this quality of like, yeah. Remember the time I told I got to fuck. Fuck off. You didn't know what to make of it. And it's like, I don't know if that's an Irish quality in particular, but it feels Irish to me, you know. Because I feel like Irish people like to self destruct. And, and the Irish people I know do self destruct. It's not just me. I've actually said to people, like, no, don't do that. And they're like, they don't know what I'm saying. And then they kind of have a glimmer, like, oh yeah, we do do that. Right. You do you, you do kind of like screw screw the thing up for yourselves without, without realizing it. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I may have done that too. Also, by be like I told you before, before we even started these cameras, a lot of energy, you know, yes. coming out of the gate, like a jack in the box. That's that 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 I've been, you know, uh, doing a lot of jobs that were not what I wanted to do, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, let's go. So uh, you come off as having an aggressive energy, 
and trying to trying to get people to do something for you, you know, and whatnot. But that's that's the only way to do it. I mean, those the people that bulldoze their way are the only ones that make it in the business. Forcing it, it's the only way. Nice, nice. It's like everybody says, nice guys finish last. You know what I mean? So if you try to be too nice, right, right, you're like, hey, look, I don't want to bother you. It's like people are like, oh, good, because I got to deal with the people that bother me. And take care of them. <laughs> That's how it is. You know what I mean? So you're smart to to try to barrel and you know push a little bit. Not like you're being right, right. You weren't that bad. You were actually very civil with me. But I'm saying, yeah, you have to make your presence felt and just say, could I email? And follow up. I mean, it's got to yeah, be yeah, done yeah. that way. For sure, for sure. Like all those sales guys, salespeople really know something about right, doing that about right. life. You know, like they just know, like, hey, you got it. You want it? Do you really believe it? It's, and then half of the time they force themselves to believe in a product. We actually believe in what we're doing. Right. We're like, hey, don't do me any favors. It's like, no, do me a favor. Right, right, exactly. And uh, you you love Goodfellas. Nobody, you might be like one of the top five people in the world. I, I, I feel like I am, but, you know. Um, what are, um, what, what, what are uh, maybe five other films, dramas or comedies that, 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 Maybe don't take, you know, don't knock it off first place, but that you definitely like drama, comedy, doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, um, uh, well, I mean, there's so many, but I mean, you know, On the Waterfront. Right, classics. You know, In the Heat of the Night, you ever see that one? Yes, I did. I mean, that's an amazing movie. Um, Sidney Poitier yeah. and uh, Rod Steiger. Yes. La Strada, you ever see La Strada? The no, Fellini. I've got to see that. Yeah, Fellini. Seven after eight and a half, I kind of stopped a little. No, bit. forget eight and a half. That's right, like, right. That was too obscure. No, yeah. this is like I'm a chord, La Strada, like those Fellini movies. You're like, oh my god, oh my god, amazing, you know? Um, yeah, I like those like th those type of movies, like uh, those you know, like European type movies. I mean, I've seen. I used to go to this video store, and the lady was this old. Uh, I think she might have been Persian, but. She used to, she was dying in a way. Mm -hmm. you know, it was in the last video, so the late 90s, she'd go, did I this? Every week she'd give me a new movie. And every week it was a foreign movie, one an Iranian, one Chinese. And they were always, she had the best taste in, I wish she was around. She had the right. best taste in movies ever. Right, right. Like, you know, Quentin Tarantino watched all these videos. She watched all videos. She was amazing. And as, as an Irishman. Yes. A movie by Phil Janu. I'm curious, I'm really curious to know if you've seen it. It came out the same year as Goodfellas, but it was highly overshadowed. It didn't have any of its comedic elements. State of Grace. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a couple of my friends, my closest friends that worked on there, they were actually in the meta position of, it was about their the Westies? friends, and they're working on it at the same time. Right. But, uh, but they all said the same thing about that movie. They all said, you know, it wasn't exactly capturing, but they all said Gary Oldman was... They said it was like watching a ghost. Of not the guy he was playing, but this other guy, Jackie Coonan, who was, he was playing Mickey Featherston, supposedly, but they all said it was like watching a ghost. All the guys I know from that neighborhood, and uh, one is even a filmmaker named Bobby Moresco, and they all said it was like watching a ghost, watching Gary Oldman in that movie. They said he was that good. My, my, like, for my generation, I have brothers that are older than me, like 10 years older. Right. So I'd be watching Scarface at 7 or 8 years old. <laughs> and listening to Zeppelin at 7 or 8 years right. old. Right. But basically, uh, okay, I mean, Al Pacino knocked me out in Scarface. Yes. But for my, ge for, for my money, for my, like if yeah. I, wa I want to take somebody, pin him from my generation, yeah. it literally is Gary Oldman from that movie. He's done, he's done great work. With Coppola in... Sid and uh, Nancy. Right, Sid and Nancy. How amazing was he and her in that? Yeah, just just out of Jesus. out of control amazing. Out of control amazing. It was amazing. too amazing in that. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, but him in that movie, they, they... Well, guess what? It's It was stamped by the guys that lived it, so they were like... They were blown away by Gary Oldman in that movie. And you know, I'm sure they were sitting there going, what's this nonsense? These guys trying to be like us. And they were blown away. By his performance. By his performance. Well, I, I ended up picking up a book in the library, and then I, I slowly found out that it was Sean Penn who had produced that. Right, right, right. And who had, uh, like, the guy who wrote the script with him, they put uh, Vito, uh, um, uh, Ber the Borelli guy, the big fat guy, the, the mobster, the right, mobster right, right, guy, right, right. Was, was just somebody's father. Oh, uh, And he ended up getting that with, uh, with Robert De Niro after that. Well, let me tell you something. The little bit I know, nobody's just somebody's father. <laughs> <laughs> Something's always behind everything. 
Oh, that's for sure. Whether it's showbiz or the other side, nobody's just somebody's fault. Um, what the, what I, I, I might just want to touch on two people now. Sure. Uh, because I know you, what time are you going on now? Eight. You're going on at eight? And it's 646. And if, and if... It's 646. 746. 746. Oh, okay, yeah. So if Tim Gage decides that he, he, he's had enough... If he bails, well, he goes on today. I go on eight fifteen, whatever. Uh, oh, okay. So we got we got just a, just a little bit. Sure. Um, I wanted to discuss. Actually, I've got a third because it's it's very important. But um, Patrice O'Neill. Yeah. Um, he looked up to you something mad, something crazy. If you listen to that la that last episode where he was on O and A, you were a part of that too. Yeah. In hindsight, it was so weird that I was there. It was so weird because I ran into him there and then I ran into him outside Jay Moore's podcast three days later and I hadn't seen, we hadn't seen each other in a long time. And Vaughn was saying how he was, how, uh, you know, he told her to say, tell Colin I want a picture with him because he didn't have the courage to come and see you and do it. it very, for a guy with, with that much balls and that much courage oh, yeah. and who, who could command a stage and, and no one was, you know. Oh my God, I mean... The only, the only positive thing about his death is that people started to really appreciate how great he was. You know what I mean? Right. We all know. Right. But the people that, you know, didn't know, suddenly they were like, oh, Patrice, he was so... Well, you mentioned him and Geraldo in Montreal as, you know, how come these guys couldn't have gotten shows? Yeah. You know? And in the words of, like, David Lee Roth, David Lee, David Lee Roth had said this one time, where he, he was talking about a guitarist, but he said, you know, the world was getting ready to print his picture. And that's the way I feel about Patrice, because the roast and elephant in the room, that I know you've seen. Of course. That I know you've seen. Of course, elephant in the room. Well, let me tell you, you know, Patrice was just that guy. I mean, like I said, Tough Crowd was really supposed to be my show. But every episode, I'd just be like this, listening. And I couldn't interrupt. I could shut him off any time. I had no problem with it. But he'd just be going, and he'd just take a turn. He'd turn a corner, i go, okay, where's this going? I'd find myself like one of the audience members going, I want to hear where this goes before he tells right. me to shut up. Because that's how his his comedy is. Okay, here it is. And you're like, okay, this is going... I'll tell you another guy who's like that, Norm MacDonald. People don't realize. Right. Norm MacDonald will be talking about something, and he he's like, yeah, you know. And you're like, yeah. Wait, wait, he just went that way. Nobody ever went that way. Right, right. He's a fellow like, Canadian. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> he's another one that just... But Patrice had that personality where that's what he would do. Right. He'd take it and... A totally different direction. And Norm loved him. Norm loved him. Norm loved yeah. what he had done on uh, what he had done on the roast. And he said, "What I really like about Patrice, he's right. You know, the guys that are doing this role should be the friends. It just shouldn't be writers writing for for actors." Exactly. Together. It killed it. Right. 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 And now I, I, you know, I mean, with the James Franco roast, it seemed to have gone back to the way it was, like like the Patrice O'Neill roast. Yes. My yes. God. You know, uh, Ben Bailey did a great job. Oh yeah. He did. I, I, I can't believe you saw that. No, I've heard it. This you, you, the recorded. lore, the lore. You have never heard back. You haven't heard that. I didn't know it existed. Okay, because all I, I do is remember sitting there, and it made Ben Bailey's whole career. Exactly. I, I was talking to Patrick Milligan about this, where we discuss you. I've discussed you to so many people. To to not have you in this documentary would, would be been? like as <laughs> if I was following a ghost around. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm glad I'm here. And Greg Giraldo. Because it seems like they're going to Oh, my music. God. Greg Giraldo was... Uh, a monster. Yeah, we're, the, the music people here in the background, the show is about to start. So right. Even Greg Giraldo was just such a... Uh, so, and he just kept... I mean, it was he kept writing more material and writing more material. It was just like the direction he was going in, would, but he had his other problems. But, boy, he was in such an interesting direction. Right. That was, a, that was a, another shattering one. You know what I mean? It, it, it wasn't surprising when it happened, but it was. I was just. Oh, yeah. It made me sick. Right, right, right. Because you mad at him because he was, he was really, you know, he was one of the guys you just loved and a great person. But right, right. Just like he wasn't like an idiot about it. He was just. He loved it. He appreciated. You, you it. felt the genuineness with with Greg. Oh as, yes. As as roasting as he was on those roasts. On the roast, he was roasting, but he was just crying out and. You know, there was so much there that wasn't just, you know, roast. It was like crying out for everybody to understand. You know what I mean? Like, right. He was just trying to break. He was just trying to do his thing. But yeah, really like when he freaks out on Larry the Cable Guy. And he goes, how the hell are you so popular? Right. Right, right, right. Um, I know we, we discussed this, actually. The first time I met you was with Big A. 
I, Big A, I, I, uh, I owe Big A a bullet in the gut for for introducing me to you at um, uh, the Creek in the Cave. Right, right. Actually, Rebecca Trent, she 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 worked on uh, unconstitutional. Rebecca unconstitutional. Right, right, and I'm. I'm I like yeah. to do this so I can also segue nicely. Yes. Uh, you, 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 you were upfront and honest with me. You, 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 you didn't know Otto, but you must have seen. I knew him. him. Yeah, of course. You, I, oh, oh, you knew him. You I knew him, but not well. You didn't know him. Well. Not like a Jim Norton knew right, him. Right. Well. I only worked with him like once or twice. Oh and wow. I, no, I never worked. I never worked with Otto. I just, for whatever reason, I rolled in with you know, other people when I was doing those Jersey one nighters. You know. Right. But I mean, but you know, but a couple of times I met him, I was like, this guy's hilarious, you know. But I did not know Otto well by any means. You know? Right, 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 right. And just for whatever reason, we just never crossed paths much. So let me just throw one more name out there. Sure. I Bob Levy is just a funny. Every time you think Bob is is like out of it, he comes back. He's so funny. He's so quick. But it's like, um, you know, yeah, he has a tough time getting out of the, uh, you know. And I mean, he's another nut that likes to tell people to go. You know, right, themselves. right, right. And what what ended up happening is you said that your career, look at my career. I'm I'm now doing firehouses with Bob Levy. Yeah, I said I'm. I said I walked on stage and I go look, and the whole crowd started laughing at the firehouse, because they were like, yeah, what the fuck, what are you doing here? You you used to play a lot. I guess in the beginning of your career, a lot of those VFW halls. And oh whatnot. yeah, well they would. They weren't firehouses when I started, but they were like those kind of gigs. Like right. I had heard of Otto and George because they worked those same, you know. Right. But in those days they were like one nighters, but there were no firehouses for that kind of comedy. Where the IRA would bullshit and do some kind of party, and you guys would raise money for them right. and whatnot. <laughs> right. Um, wow. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up because I'm stealing a lot of your time. I think I had one more question. Pips Comedy Club. Yes. What was your involvement with Pips? First time I got to do an official set was at Pips because I stayed next to the owner when these guys came in, some Italian guys, their friend hadn't passed at the club, and they came in and started throwing chairs, chased the crowd out. Right. They just strung off the room one Wednesday audition night. So I stood next to the owner, even though I could have gotten a bad beating. And so then they gave me a Friday night because I stood with them. Mm. And then I bombed and never worked there for years. But, I mean, Pips was Brooklyn, so I was like, ooh. I mean, this place was a comedy club. You know that it's had to close down because of, like, I guess more of a Russian influx. Yes, there's and, a Russian nightclub next door. Right, and uh, Ray Garvey, about, you, you were mentioning Ray, Ray Garvey. Ray Garvey, we did a couple of benefits. Well, a couple passed of away just not not too long ago. When, a couple when of years A couple now, of years yeah. now, right? Yeah. And he was taking care of it. He was doing a good job with it, I guess. And uh, Yeah, uh, yeah. And there's a guy too. called Joey Gay, I think. Yeah, also, Joey Gay, of course. Was, and Joey. You know, taking care of it and whatnot. And uh, that's that's a shame. Is is there any other clubs in in Brooklyn? And she no, no, they had a couple for a minute back in the early nineties. They had a place in when there was a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a shake. Bay Ridge and a place in Bensonhurst. But I mean, I never worked right. them. But I mean, I always wanted to. But uh, yeah, something. Uh, it's it's crazy, you know. And there's a guy now. I forget. He's a comedian. He's got like a, a yearly thing that he does. Um, Andy Kindler <laughs> in Montreal. Is there the uh, it, you think there's an opportunity to have like um, Colin Quinn's own version of a residency for the Just for Laughs? I would love it. I would love to just seriously. Do it. I would love to do a new show there all the time. You know what I mean? Right, where you would be there like every year for the festival. If yes, you could, I would if love it. If you could it. line it up, I love Montreal. I love the festival. What about like, Canadians? Yeah, you like Canadians? What do you think? Yes, about I think they they're my kind of crowd. They're intelligent. They love when, when I go up there with any of my shows, they love it. I wish I spent more time there doing my stuff, you know what I mean? Greedily, I'll ask one, one more question. Yes. Um, when you, when you and, uh, and Seinfeld were doing that DVD commentary, you, you, which was a little while back, but you, you said comedy had changed, and you said, like, even the limo driver knows about comedy now. Like, more people know about comedy now than they've ever known in the past. Yes, they do. That's Tim Gage's finger. That's his finger. Yeah. This is the guy. What's that? We're going at five. You know the music, right? Okay. <laughs> Screw you, Rocky. What are some wings, Sir, will you? Wings, I'll tell her. Spicy? No. Spicy. Just get a double wings. That's right, you're Irish. Fucking wings. Right. Yeah, double wings. He might want some, you might want some. All right, I got you. Chisel. All right, I'm Anything else, Mr. Quinn? No, thanks. Yeah. Um... You had said, you had said, ah, oh, I don't know when Aziz Ansari's new album is coming out. Right, right, right. 
So when, when do you think that happened? That now more people more than ever know about comedy. I mean, ingest it. I like it. I mean, it's a it's a thing. It's ha just happened in the past ten years. You know, it's Comedy Central played so much comedy that I thought like in the old days people got sick of comedy, but in this case people started watching on. I'm sick of this type. I'm sick of so they started to get really into like the right. specifics and all the podcasts and everything else. It became a thing. It became part of the culture in a big way. Well. Listen, I think you got you deserve a little four or five minutes before you got to go on. Well, thank you. <laughs> Deservedly so. Thank you so much. Now, did Norton and uh, Voss do this or no? Voss, Voss... Uh, got scared by Club Soda Kenny. No, Voss, Voss in Montreal looked at me like, please put me on TV. He gave me the please put me on TV look. Yes. And then when Club Soda Kenny did his thing, then he realized that I was a douchebag, and he trashed me to you when him and Bonnie did that show. They had you on, and they said, there was a guy in Montreal, he was asking about you, this crazy guy. Oh, I think I remember this. He was talking about Voss, so I just thought I could just bust in. Yes, you way. could. Come uh, on in. Come on in. No, come, come into the shop. What kind do you want any on the... <laughs> they wanted a barbecue, or what I said, just regular fries. Oh, just regular hot wings. Here, yeah, here's some sauce right now for you. You want that sauce on it? Because I'll put it on there for you if that's the sauce you want. Hi, guys. Don't listen to a fucking thing this guy's saying. He knows Hot nothing. Hot sauce. I mean, I, whatever. Barbecue, called. or do you want just regular fried buffalo? Buffalo, and now you want hot. See, did, He's, you got it on tape. He said, no, no, I don't want spicy. I don't want it. And now he wants buffalo wings. Thank you. All right? <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to show that I have Home Depot lighting. That's, that's great, that's Tim. Good. This is being pretty important to set up, actually. <laughs> All right, later. I gotta go. So we're gonna start. Why don't you go Thanks, Tim. It is. It's on. It's gonna oh, be some warm. Fuck money. off! Huh? Fuck you! Oh, another another famous Colin Quinn thing. Ah, this, this. Yes, yes. My frustration. Ah. Thank you, Colin. This could be my promo for the documentary. Oh.